You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing? I do hope you're okay. Well, the pantomime is over. This is the last time I will talk about it. For some of you, I'm sure that's a relief, but others, I've had so many messages about it. So thank you. Uh, it went really well. And I'm now in that stage where I'm missing it already. It was just, there was on the last night, every time I delivered a line, I seemed to get applause. It was great. And I got, um, I received a DAFTA award afterwards, not a BAFTA, better than a BAFTA, a DAFTA. And my category was person most likely to end up on TV. Just show off, I think they were saying. And no, oh, it was just so much fun. Back to reality now, but in a way not, because I've just returned from London. I've been to a press conference for M.W. Craven. Most of you will have heard me rave about Mike's books, M.W. Craven's books, um, the series with Tilly and Poe and just how much we love them. Well, he's branching out. He's uh, Tilly and Poe are not done. They're, they're not done. There is a story there. But the next book coming out in June by Mike is called Fearless. And it looks absolutely incredible. And there's going to there's going to be a lot there's going to be a lot of big things happening about around that book. So that's very exciting. And if you're interested, go to the QuickBook Reviews Facebook group and you'll see a photo of myself with Mike at the conference. I had a copy of Mike's book and Mike had a quick book reviews bookmark. Yes, he did. So that's there for you. But anyway, we need to get on with the books. And what books are we doing? I've got such a selection for you. So the first one is The Spy Across the Water by James Nockerty. And James is going to come and join us and talk to us about that book. I've got Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. And Liz is going to come on and talk to us about that book. I've got, I'm going to review Wayward by Amelia Hart. A Marvellous Light by Freya Mask. And Never, Never by, a, this is a collab between Colleen Hoover and Taryn Fisher. I have never read any of Colleen's books before. I have read and enjoyed Tarrant. So, yes, this is an interesting one to talk to you about. But let's get started straight away with The Spy Across the Water. Let us do the blurb on this one for you. Faces from the past appear from nowhere at a family funeral and Will Fleming, spy turned ambassador, is drawn into twin mysteries that threaten everything he holds dear. From Washington, he's pitched into the troubles in Northern Ireland and an explosive secret hidden deep in the most dangerous but fulfilling friendship he has known. And while he confronts shadowy adversaries in American streets and looks for solace at home in the Scottish Highlands, he discovers that his government's most precious Cold War agent is in mortal danger and needs his help to survive. In an electric story of courage and betrayal, Fleming learns the truth that his life has left him a man with many friends, but still alone. Now, we have something very new. It's a whole new feature. I have interviewed James, James Nockerty, the author, and he wanted to read the first sentence himself. So I thought, right, instead of me always reading the first sentence from this point on, if I remember... I'm going to get the author to read the first sentence. So let's go to James Nockerty to read us the first sentence now. Will Fleming thought nothing could distract him from the open grave. He was wrong. Well, that's quite a good first sentence, isn't it? My goodness, that packs a punch. What's not to love about this book? It has everything. It's got the, the you know, the spy elements. You've got the tension and the pace. You've got the background information. You've got the characters. I really enjoyed it. And I would expect nothing less from James Nockerty. I really would because, you know, come on, we've heard him host the Today programme. We've heard him host a book club on Radio 4. I've seen him at the Hay Festival. But it's 
he's got this incredible knowledge and yet he imparts it in such a, re- a readable way, I would say. So enough about me. Let's talk to James. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome today James Nockerty, whose latest wonderful book is called The Spy Across the Water. James, welcome to the podcast. Delighted to be here. Lovely to talk. Well, let's start with a really basic first question, the obvious one. Can you tell us a little bit about this glorious book? I'd be happy to. It's a spy story. It's an espionage story. I hope it's also a story about people, not just events, particularly one man. It's set against a real background in the 1980s, um, where various political events were going on of interest, uh, but not really known to the public. But the book is not about those events, which I'll describe in a moment. It's about the people that are caught up in them and how they behave. And the central figure, the hero in a way, is called Will Fleming, about whom I've written before, who was trained as a secret agent, as a spy in MI6 and and pursued that career for a while. He then went briefly into politics in the 70s, about which I wrote a book. And he's now found himself as the British ambassador in Washington, doing his job for the government. It's 1985. Two events really ensnare him. One is a connection with someone when he knew, uh, whom he knew when he was working undercover, connected with the troubles in Northern Ireland. The other is a figure who gives him some information about a particular Cold War story. The Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West was still going on in 1985, of course. And he has to balance his various loyalties, his friendships, his loyalty particularly to his family against his duty as ambassador and as a servant of his government. And I hope it's a story that is full of suspense and interest. And I hope a certain amount of um, character painting, because I find Fleming a very interesting man and he is a guy with great depths. And the funny thing about him, just to finish this preliminary burst, which has gone on for too long, he is a he's a smooth guy. He's clever. He's talented. He's risen to the top. He's regarded as a very good ambassador. He knows how to deal with people. He uh, has all the equipment. And yet, fundamentally, he's a loner. Mm. And I think that is what fascinates me about him, that he has many friends, many loyalties, he enjoys life, but inside he is the cat who walks alone. And you talk about this balance between the characters and what happens, the sort of more technical side of the story. And mm. I really enjoy that because, you know, I cared enough about the characters, but yet I still wanted to know what, what was going on. Was that hard to achieve? Did that take some edits or did it was it there from the beginning? Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of rewriting. I mean, I you know, I've been writing all my life as a journalist in newspapers and then, you know, working for the BBC. And so writing is something that... I I sort of do every day and enjoy. But when you're doing it like this, I find myself rewriting a huge amount. And in fact, the rewriting is what I enjoy most. You can sort of get the story down and then you say, well, hang on a minute, does that really work? And you fiddle away with it. And in my case, because I live part of the time in Edinburgh and part of the time in London, uh, regular travellers on the East Coast train between Edinburgh and London hear this sort of mad tapping away on the laptop it's only me um (laughs) banging away on the story but what i discovered when i started doing the odd bit of fiction a few years ago is that i really enjoy writing dialogue and i really enjoy which of course you don't do as a reporter really when you say what you see and you describe events and so on and you report what people say but you don't make up their conversation and i've enjoyed that hugely and I've also enjoyed the idea of getting inside the head of a character. Now, he's not a character that's particularly like me, although he was born in Scotland, and he has a great love of Scotland. And in that sense, we share one passion in common. But he is emphatically not me. So in a way, I'm getting to know him. And that's fun. I really enjoy it. 
And yet, with all your broadcast experience, in a way, there was that dialogue there because, you know, I would listen to you every morning on Radio 4, on the Today programme, and and so you would hear those words. As far as dialogue is concerned, I think if you work in radio particularly, and I worked in newspapers for a long time before that, you have to have a bit of an ear for dialogue, for the telling anecdote, the story, the voice that works. And if you're describing things, particularly if you're abroad in a distant place where a listener hasn't been, describing a scene that they can only imagine, that they haven't experienced for themselves. What essentially you're doing is saying, this is what it's like to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're listening to a politician making a speech in, I don't know, some political convention in Chicago, or if you're in the streets of Cairo, or if you're, uh, you know, at the scene of a disaster or something, whatever it is, you're trying to say, look, this is what it feels like. It's what it's here, what it is to be here. And so that... uh, interest and that enthusiasm is one that translates I think quite well into writing a story. The other thing about journalism it always strikes me is that the fundamental thing about it, the quality that you need in order to be able to do it at all, doesn't mean that you'll be good at it, but it's the it's the fundamental quality, is curiosity. You've got to know you've got to want to know what happens next. Why did he say that? What's, what's What's going on there? What lies behind? And of course, in writing a story, particularly if it's in a kind of thriller format, I think what you're always trying to do is to suggest to the reader, not in too clunky a way, I hope, that there's something else going on, or there may be something else going on. Now, the problem that you and I have got at the moment is I don't think we can go into the plot in too much detail. No, we don't want any spoilers. We don't want spoilers. Except, I mean, what I will say is that a series of events at the very beginning, which involve a family funeral, which Fleming attends in New York, begin to uncover scenes and people from his past, which lead him very quickly into into some danger, into a conflict of, uh, you know, personal decision making about what he does and who he tells, but fundamentally. What it reveals is a loyalty, a personal loyalty through friendship, which is very profound, although it is unlikely. It cuts across, if you like, professional loyalties and the loyalty of duty to government and country, or it appears to. And it's that balance in him that I think should make the reader Mm. interested in what happens next. Now, I mean, there's quite a bit of... I think, adventure and danger and double crossing and all the things you would expect in a story like this. I hope that it is anyway enough to keep people interested. But there is also this sense of thinking about this character and um, not just how does he get out of this pickle, which is a good question and it's one that most books like this should pose, but um, what's going on in his head? And I suggest, I think, in writing about him that I probably know what's going on in his head. But even I, who am in complete control of his action and his character, I'm not entirely sure. And I'm interested because the character was so strong, it really stayed with me afterwards. And yet for you, in past times as a journalist, you can't afford to let the people that you're writing about stay with you. Did this, or perhaps, (laughs) perhaps they did, but did this character stay with you more? That's such an interesting observation really which I haven't thought about but it's absolutely true I mean if you're dealing with people as a journalist let's say in politics I was a political correspondent for years uh, before I started doing uh, well one and today on the radio and of course you you manage a certain distance you have to write about people to some extent dispassionately on the other hand there are some people that you like and admire and have a you know a sympathetic relationship, not necessarily because you believe in their politics, but just because you uh, you quite like them and you're intrigued by them. You can't let that go too far. But um, you're absolutely right. You have this slight distance. You move on to do something else. You maybe meet someone again six months later and you say, how are you? And, you know, you have lunch and you talk about things and you feel quite close to them for a bit and perhaps they tell you something interesting and then you're off again. You know, you're a bird of passage. Whereas if you stick with a character like this, you do have to get inside his head because I've got to work out how will he deal with this? And one of the things in a story like this, which 
essentially involves various mysteries. Um, things that he learns that he realizes are very sensitive and have to be measured in the way that they can be passed on to others. He's got some colleagues he trusts, some colleagues he's less sure of. So he's always trying to decide what the best thing to do is. And of course, it's all very well to say I'm kind of pulling the strings, which is true, because I'm making it up. On the other hand, I'm wondering as well, not just what's the right thing to do, but what would he do? How much would he tell his closest friend? What would he hold back? And what's the nature of the central relationship in this book, which is a friendship that goes back to the depths of the trouble, the troubles in Northern Ireland, and is therefore, of course, dangerous, uh, life-threatening for both of them. And yet it's a relationship which has meant a great deal to Fleming, not just professionally, it's helped him in his job in the past, but it's meant a lot to him emotionally because it involved on both sides of the friendship a certain putting aside of attitudes and history and background in order to make this relationship work. One that was useful to them both, professionally, if I can use that word, but also in terms of its emotional trust. And I think that's, for me, the interesting thing. Uh, how do you manage that kind of relationship? Now, it's not a meditation on friendship, because that would be a little bit boring, unless I was a better writer than I am. Uh, it's a story that has a beginning, a middle and an end, and I hope has moments of excitement in it. But fundamentally, I think that's the theme. But I'm interested because in your time as a as a journalist, you must have accumulated the biggest James's notebook of interesting things to put in a story. And then also you obviously are a great supporter of authors, of fiction authors with the, the programmes that you do. So, again, you've got another notepad of interesting ideas from the fiction books. Is there almost too much to, to go at? Well, I think <laughs> you've, you've identified a real problem. I mean, you do have this sort of attic in the top of your head of experiences and comments. And I should say the two events that we're talking about here are really real events. In 1985, the British government was negotiating with the Irish government for the first time, um, an agreement as it came to be in November of that year, but wasn't at the time this story is set in the spring. The Anglo-Irish agreement, and it was the beginning of a cooperation between Dublin and London on Northern Ireland that really had been absent for 60 years since partition. It was the beginning of the acknowledgement by the British government that the Irish government had a role to play in starting to get to a constitutional position where the troubles might fall away. And that agreement signed by Margaret Thatcher and Garrett Fitzgerald, the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister in Dublin at the time, was an enormous step forward. It was kind of modest in its detail, but it was a tremendous signal about what lay ahead. And, you know, it was 15 years later that the implications of the Good Friday Agreement became clear, but that was one of the steps along the road. So that is in the background. I'm not writing about it. And the second event which hovers over this story is the crisis involving our best ever agent in the Soviet Union, a, a real man, who's still alive, Oleg Gordievsky, who'd been just about the best spy, as far as we know, as far as outsiders know anyway, that we ever had inside the Soviet Union. And he was better than, than anything the Americans had, which was very irritating to them because the British government was getting this priceless information from the heart of the Kremlin. Just at the moment that Gorbachev became the general secretary, the, the reformer who, although he didn't want to, in the end brought down the Soviet Union. And the Americans determined to find out who this great British spy was because they were pretty jealous. This is all true. And they worked out eventually, secretly, they worked out who it had to be, Gordievsky. Unfortunately, they didn't know that they had a traitor in their own ranks inside the CIA, a man called Aldrich Ames, who had sold his, his soul to the Soviet Union, not for ideological reasons, but for money. And he betrayed 
Gordievsky's name to the Russians. They called him back. He had to escape from Russia. It's a very dramatic story later in 1985. But it's that moment when he was betrayed by the Americans that Fleming stumbles on. And so that, which is a real event, although nearly all the characters in the book are completely fictitious, gives you a sense that this is the kind of thing that might have happened. It didn't happen like this, but it could have. And I hope that that gives a little frisson to the story. The other thing, finally, just on this point, the other thing that always fascinates me with stories like this and the reason that I enjoy them, and I wouldn't want to write a book that I wouldn't want to read myself, I have to say, is that as far as somebody like Fleming is concerned, I mean, when he worked in MI6 and subsequently he became a government minister and now he's an ambassador, he's dealing with momentous events uh, which are matters of life and death, which have big implications for government, for the relations between governments and countries. And yet, in this case, the detail is almost entirely unknown to people out there. Now, I'm not a conspiracist by nature. You know, I don't believe that the world is run by plots and subterfuge and secret cabals. And I think that's um, the stuff of fantasy, really. But I am experienced enough and grown up enough to know that inevitably in the affairs of countries and individuals, there are secrets which have to be secret. And they are sometimes more dramatic than we can imagine. And Fleming always enjoys that sense of being in the thick of an absolutely humdinger of a drama about which nobody out there as the faintest clue. I just like that. I like that little feeling. And as you, uh, you've alluded to already, one of the other things I love about him is that when he needs solace and rest, he goes back home to the Highlands of Scotland, which I know very well. And um, that's what keeps him going. I think that's where he's, that's his secret source of energy. Well, it's just been so interesting to talk to you and hear more about this book. And I think we've given everyone a, a real taste of what to expect. But I have to end with a, a very, the, the most important question on this podcast and possibly the most important question you have ever been asked, James. When you're writing, what is your biscuit of choice? What is powering the words? Huh. Um, now, that's a very interesting question. In the afternoons, a toasted tea cake. Ooh, lovely. In the morning, for a burst of energy, Scottish shortbread. The perfect answer. And what a perfect note to end on. James Nockerty, whose latest book is The Spy Across the Water. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. So let's get on to the next book straight away for you. Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. Love Liz's books. And this one is a cracker. Let me read you the blurb for it. Reclusive Sally Diamond causes outrage by trying to incinerate her dead father. Now she's the centre of attention, not only from the hungry media and police detectives, but also a sinister voice from a past she does not remember. As she begins to discover the horrors of her early childhood, Sally steps into the world for the first time, making new friends and big decisions and learning that people don't always mean what they say. But who is the man observing Sally from the other side of the world and why does he call her Mary and why does her new neighbour seem to be obsessed with her? Sally's trust issues are about to be severely challenged. And just as we've done before with James Nockerty, we've we're going to have the author read the first sentence. I hope, I hope you enjoy this. So this is Liz Nugent reading the first sentence. Put me out with the bins, he said regularly. When I die, put me out with the bins. I'll be dead, so I won't know any different. You'll be crying your eyes out. And he would laugh, and I'd laugh too, because we both knew that I wouldn't be crying my eyes out. I never cry. I love this book so much. I loved it. It was sort of dark and twisty and the characters were just phenomenal. I wanted to keep reading it to find out what happened. It changed as it went on. I just thought it was so <laughs> different. And and it's not in a bonkers way. It's just, oh, my goodness, these characters that you end up caring for so much. 
and the highs and lows of what they go through. I just thought it was... Well, someone just has described it as compassionate and challenging. Val McDermott described it as that. And those are exactly the words I would use. Obviously, I'm not Val McDermott, so I won't even attempt to copy her words. I'll just use them. I thought it was super and um, an absolutely first class book. Let's talk to Liz. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome today Liz Nugent, whose latest simply fabulous book is Strange Sally Diamond. Liz, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's very good to have you here. Now, we're going to start with a basic question, of course. Can you tell us a little bit about this glorious book? Well, it opens with a conversation between Sally and her father. And he says, put me out with the bins. When I die, put me out with the bins. So when he dies, Sally actually puts him out with the bins. <laughs> Because she is a little strange in her thinking. She has led a very kind of sheltered life in almost a voluntary recluse. Um, you can tell it was set in, in, in lockdown. It was written in lockdown because there's so many themes of isolation, whether it's self-imposed or involuntary. So Sally is a very strange person. She's extremely antisocial. She pretends to be deaf in order to not to engage with conversations with her neighbours or locals. She lives in a very remote place on the outskirts of a tiny village in the Midlands of Ireland. And uh, when, when she incinerates her father, obviously this comes to public attention fairly quickly and people find out who she really is because she has known all her life that she was adopted, but she had no idea of her life past that and no curiosity about it. But suddenly her background, she's confronted with her background and what happened to her as a child. Therein lies the tale of how the past can catch up with you as an adult. And also there's another narrative that comes into the book about a third of the way through, which is set in a different timeline and it's from somebody who also grew up in the same circumstances. Well, not the same circumstances, but the same milieu as Sally. And he is also a very strange character. But it, like from the beginning, you know, that they're, they're sort of on a collision course to meet. And really, uh, it's what happens when they meet It was when the, uh, the uh, drama happens. And Sally is just, she's such a wonderful character. I mean, I, I know the title is Strange Sally Diamond, but for me, she wasn't strange. There's bits of all of us in her, really, and I admired her in some ways. Yeah, I think she's kind of me without a filter. I hate shopping centres and I kind of, I wear makeup as little as possible. She There's lots of traits in Sally. She says and does the wrong thing all the time. I'm the worst person ever for putting my foot in it and saying the wrong thing. She abhors small talk. Me too. There's lots of things about Sally that are that are me. Um, I hate shopping. <laughs> <laughs> like there's, there's so much of Sally that is in me that gave me the freedom to express my real thoughts about certain social situations through Sally. So I had great fun writing her. So it wasn't a case of what would Sally do, it's, it's a case of what would Liz do. It's kind <laughs> of, kind of, I suppose. But then, you know, Sally's, Sally's history is very dark and her, her mm. behaviours, um, like she... She rushes to anger quite a lot. She can be a little violent at times when she feels personally threatened. And that is a result of trauma she suffered as a very small child, but doesn't remember for various reasons, which are revealed in the book. And did any of Sally's story surprise you as you were writing it? Or did you know everything before you started the first chapter? The whole thing was a surprise. I had the opening line, put me out with the men's. That's all I had. So mm -hmm. then I created this character, Sally, who put her father out with the men's. And like in all of my books, they're kind of a psychological study of characters. So... Um, I just kept going deeper with her. And again, you know, with the other main character who lives on the other side of the world, I kept going deeper and deeper with them to see what motivates them and what, you know, what could have happened to Sally? What could have happened to Peter? 
to make them the adults they are. And um, yeah, it, it was one of those things where I just kept digging and digging and digging into their backgrounds to see what could possibly, what could possibly, you know, make them end up the way they are. Um, and I'm fascinated, like I have no degree in psychology or psychiatry or anything like that, but I am fascinated by human nature and, you know, the, the depths of it as well as the heights of it. Like Sally, despite her traumatic background, has a great sense of humour, but she really hates it when people laugh at her. Who doesn't? Um, you know, she's she's she she really is me without a filter in a lot of way. And and the traumatic background, I had I had a sort of tra traumatic background in different ways. Like I had a brain hemorrhage when I was a child, um, which led to a lot of kind of darkness and hospitals and therapy and physiotherapy. I mean, whereas Sally you know, has a deeply emotionally traumatic background. And and yet when you say, you know, she's she says the wrong thing, in many ways she's saying the right thing. She's saying the honest thing. Yes. When when, you know, it's that typical thing of congratulating somebody being on being pregnant when they've put on a little weight, you know. Yeah. That kind of thing, you know, and like Taking her father literally when he says, when I die, put me out with the bins. And so, you know, what they do in their rural village is they incinerate their rubbish. So she puts them into a refuse sack and puts them out with the bins and pours a bit of petrol on them and up he goes. All of that is handled quite lightly. You know, it's, it's um, and even in the darkest, more disturbing passages of the book, I never go into that graphically because I don't want to write it and I'm pretty sure readers don't want to read how dark some of the background stuff is. So, you know, um, it's really the reader's imagination that is challenged rather than uh, rather than what I write. You know, if, if uh, it's probably a book that will come with a lot of trigger warnings by uh, reviewers but I don't think it gets I don't think it gets too disturbing if it does that's that's the reader's imagination not mine <laughs> I say in self-defense it seems that writing means a lot to you is it very important is it who you are through and through funny enough yeah it's only recently I've sort of defined myself as a writer because, you know, I've only, this is only my fifth book. And somebody, I did hear somebody saying, you're not a real writer unless, until you've written five books. So now I finally feel like maybe, maybe I do now qualify as a writer. Is it important to me? Yeah, I guess it's, yeah, I, I guess it's the first job I've had in my life where I'm the boss. <laughs> so, um. Mm -hmm. You know, I can give myself a few days off if I need them. Um, I can also bully myself into the office and I can, you know, I can, um, I'm not very disciplined, which is quite an issue with me. I really have to force myself to sit down at the laptop and write. Um, I Like I have the opening line of the next book, but I haven't got a second line yet. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I came up with that line about, four weeks ago and uh so i haven't quite worked out where that book is going to go so yeah i kind of i have a love hate relationship with my writing i'm like dorothy parker who said she hates writing but loves having written <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i think um yeah i think that kind of describes my approach as well anything to avoid it so i love doing <laughs> Podcasts like these or book festivals or, you know, going to other people's launches is always fun because it's it's sort of part of the job, but also takes you away from the laptop. So when was the first moment that you thought, I want to write? N forget book five. Well, then there must have been that epicentre of when it started. There was a moment when I there was there was a radio show that's been running for about 40 years called Sunday Miscellany and it's on Irish National Radio 
um, RT Radio 1. And it's just little nostalgia pieces. Uh, the, the only um, criteria is that it has to be true and it has to be personal. So it's about little kind of nostalgic pieces. So the very first thing I submitted as a piece of writing to anywhere was a little piece I wrote about um, being gifted a pair of gloves, a really exquisite pair of gloves by a stranger in a shop that happened, you know, 20 years before I wrote it down. And when I wrote it down and I submitted it, I just kind of thought I have a really slim chance, but it was accepted and um, and then broadcast on the radio. And I was really chuffed at that. And then I thought, God, maybe I'd try my hand at a short story. So I I did that. And that, again, got shortlisted for this major prize. It's a big competition here, the Francis McManus Short Story Competition. And I got shortlisted, I think it was down to the final 12. And I didn't get placed. But then that gave me you know, encouragement, every little thing, everything, everything I did kind of got accepted or I, I, I entered another competition to write the pilot episode of a TV drama series for a European Broadcasting Union competition and I won. <laughs> and I like that gave me encouragement. Then what there was something else I, oh, I entered a, a competition to write a half hour live drama a half hour TV drama to be broadcast live on television. And I won that. And like, it just seemed like I was being guided towards writing that, you know, that this was something that I might actually be good at. So when I wrote um, Unraveling Oliver, which came out of this short story competition, Unraveling Oliver came out of that short story that I had entered into the Francis McManus short story competition. And it, um, I developed that into a, a, a novel, a very short novel, I think 58,000 words. And that was, uh, that was my first novel published in 2014. So yeah, that was a total shock to me that I was able to write a book. And then the second biggest shock was that once that was published, it won Crime Novel of the Year award, and 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 then uh, the publishers asked me to write another one, and I, I, you know, I had never expected. I thought I would just write one book, and then go into hiding like Harper Lee, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, it it didn't quite set the world on fire. It didn't trouble the British. The UK top 10, although it was number one here for quite some time in Ireland. Yeah, the career crept up on me, I have to say, I, you know. And we need to mention as well, although we're recording this a couple of weeks in advance, that yesterday it was announced that Strange Sally Diamond has been selected as only one of six books that's going to be on the next series of uh, Between the Covers, the Sarah Cox book show on BBC Two. I mean, congratulations. Yeah, that's like a career high. That's out, I mean, completely out, out of the blue. I only heard about it a week ago. So it's it's still, you know, I asked my husband to peel me off the ceiling <laughs> yesterday because I was just so high and excited about it. It's just... Yeah, it's a dream come true for any writer to be featured on that show. And um, yeah, I'm thrilled. And I'm thrilled that two two of my friends, Doug Johnson and Sebastian Barry, uh, are also on that list yeah. of six. So it, yeah, it's really, I'm really thrilled about it. Absolutely delighted. It's going to be very exciting to see that when it's on. Now, we come to the last question, which is obviously the critical and most important question on this podcast. Liz, can you tell us what biscuits are powering the writing of this book? OK, I do like the little deluxe range of ginger stem cookies. Oh, we're going for a ginger option. Yes, they're very brittle and dry, but they are the best thing because actually I'm fueled by tea. I have to admit I'm fueled by tea. But um, I'm not much of a coffee drinker, so tea is the thing. But um, a, a deluxe branded little ginger stem biscuit is my biscuit du jour. 
<laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I just can't wait to see all the interest in this book because it's it's going to be massive. But Liz Nugent, author of Strange Sally Diamond, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, let's get on to the next book, Wayward by Amelia Hart. I'd seen this book before and I'd um denied about it, wasn't sure. And then on the morning that I told myself that I was not going to buy any more printed books, it was only going to be on the Kindle, I think it was, it was probably less than 90 minutes later, I was in Waterstones. Why? Why do I even go into these shops? It, I know it's not going to end well. I can't go in and just look. I don't have that strength. Anyway, into Waterstones I went and there was a copy of Wayward with the most beautiful sprayed edges I've ever seen. So I was like, right, I've, I need to have this book. And I am so glad I did. This is sensational. Listen to the blurb. Kate, 2019, Kate flees London, abandoning everything for Cumbria and Wayward Cottage, inherited from her great aunt. There, a secret lurks in the bones of the house, hidden ever since the witch hunts of the 17th century. Violet, 1942, Violet is more interested in collecting insects and climbing trees than in becoming a proper young lady, until a chain of shocking events changes her life forever. Alpha, 1619. Altha is on trial for witchcraft, accused of killing a local man. Known for her uncanny connection with nature and animals, she's a threat that must be eliminated. But wayward women belong to the wild and they cannot be tamed. <laughs> now, I'll do the first sentence or sentences. This is the prologue, Alpha, 1619. Ten days they'd held me there. Ten days with only the stink of my own flesh for company. This book is amazing. So, yes, you've got these three women and you might think, oh, that sounds a bit complicated. Am I going to remember who's who? You will. You absolutely will, because they are so different in their characters and yet they are so together. And it's a story. And uh, there is a part at one point where I went, no, no. I found it compelling, interesting. I I loved it. It's go, It could be one of my top books of the year. I don't know. But I just thought it was very, very good. Wayward, you need to read it. Whether you like historical fiction or whether you like feminist fiction or whether you just want a story, a sort of, it's not a thriller, but th th there's these elements to it, these mystery. That's the word, mystery. I think this is a book for everyone. It's very, very good. Very, very good indeed. I think you've got the joyful gist of that one. Next one, A Marvellous Light by Freya Mask. Now, I've had this book for a while and this one has beautiful sprayed edges as well. But I ended up listening to it on audiobook and that had advantages. And let me say it had some disadvantages as well. So let me read you the blurb. Young baronet Robin Blythe was already in a spot of bother. He's struggling to be a decent older brother and a responsible employer and to rescue the estate ravaged by his late parents' excesses. Then an administrative mistake appoints him parliamentary liaison to a secret society and he discovers magic lies beneath the reality he's always known. Soon Robin must contend with magic's dangers as well as its beauty, for as he tries to find his missing predecessor, he attracts a deadly curse. To navigate these hazards, he'll need the help of Edwin Corsi, his prickly magical society counterpart, but his aloof associate clearly wishes Robin were anyone and anywhere else. Drawn together by unexpected perils, Robin and Edwin will discover a mystery as old as the power that binds the land, a plot that threatens every magician in the British Isles and a secret that some have already died to keep. Let's do first sentence. Sorry, I'm dropping books. OK, yeah, this is this is a good first sentence. Reginald Gatling's doom found him beneath an oak tree on the last Sunday of a fast fading summer. Now, having declared for years that I wasn't into fantasy books, the last few weeks I've been telling you about some fantasy books I like, and this is another one. Now, I loved all the sort of the magic side of things, 
the the fantasy element. I found the audiobook really fresh and engaging. I, I love the world building. I love the characters. I loved everything. And then on the there are some spicy scenes. There are some spicy very spicy scenes between two chaps. That's absolutely fine. What wasn't fine for me was having the audiobook. The narrator seemed to slow down and take great delight in every detail. I've just realised I'm a prude. I just don't like to hear whoever's doing what. I just, I just don't want to hear it. I am a prude. And so I found the audiobook just a bit sort of oof, right let's let's crank that speed up to three times instead of 1.4 just to get through that and back to the story i understand why it was in and i think it's great refreshing uh, that you know to have that in this sort of book all good it this is purely on me but yeah the audiobook made me i, I what i've realized is when things are very frightening or very fruity if I'm reading it, I'll just turn the pages quicker so I don't get the full effect. Whereas when it's an audiobook, there is nowhere to hide. And uh, yes, not one to listen to with young children in the car, but it's excellent. And I believe there's a follow on to it as well. So I think I might get it because it's that good a story. It really is great. It's just Prude Philippa. Um, Unable to listen to certain things. There we go. Just me. Hey ho. And we're on to the last book. You're nearly done. Never Never by Colleen Hoover and Taryn Fisher. Now, there's a lot of talk about Colleen Hoover and I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but I am not taking any sides in this. And for those people that say, oh, well, her books aren't, I don't know, intelligent enough. You know, you shouldn't read them for that reason then I, I, I don't agree with that at all. And I will put a, a stake in the sand for that and say I think that's wrong because if someone is reading a book and enjoying it, then what's the problem with that? If there are harmful things in a book, as I've heard, strangely harmful, that's another thing. But I haven't read those books, so I can't comment. So literally this was like, well, I'll read it. And this is a bit of an experiment what Colleen's writing like and of course she partnered up with Taryn Fisher who wrote The Wives that I enjoyed. Okay let's do the blurb first. Charlie Winwood and Silas Nash have been best friends since they could walk. They've been in love since the age of 14 but as of this morning they are complete strangers. Their first kiss, their first fight, the moment they fell in love every memory has vanished. Now Charlie and Silas must work together to uncover the truth about what happened to them and why. But the more they learn about the couple they used to be, the more they question why they were ever together to begin with. Forgetting is terrifying, but remembering might be worse. OK, let's do the first sentence. Chapter one, Charlie. A crash. Books fall to the speckled linoleum floor. They skid a few feet, whirling in circles and stop near feet. My feet. I don't recognise the black sandals or the red toenails, but they move when I tell them to, so they must be mine. Right? I I didn't have a problem with this book. I couldn't... Th there was nothing in it that caused me to think, oh, someone could be harmed by reading this. I thought it was um, an interesting, convincing story. I did want to keep reading it to find out what happened. I wasn't sure if it's YA or not. I read through all the blurb and there's nothing in it saying it's YA, but it did feel... It did feel to me more like a YA book. But again, nothing wrong with that. I found it um, an interesting concept and there was a sort of a different resolution to it. But yeah, it, I would probably read another Colleen Hoover on the back of this one. But whether I read something else and then disagree with what she does, who knows? But at this point, yeah, um, there we are. So there we go. Those are your five books. Let's just do a quick recap. So first we had The Spy Across the Water by James Nockerty and James kindly joined us to tell us all about that wonderful book. Then we had Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent and Liz very kindly, I'm clapping, <laughs> why am I clapping? <laughs> Liz very kindly joined us to talk to us about that wonderful book. Then I reviewed for you Wayward by Amelia Hart, go out and buy that book immediately. A Marvellous Light by Freya Mask, go and get the book but just be mindful <laughs> of the 
content and who you're reading it to or with. And Never Never by Colleen Hoover and Taryn Fisher. Those are your books. Oh, and I've just clipped my shoulder. Well, on that note, I think I should end. Got some great books, some great authors to talk to you about next week. Can't wait. But just in the meantime, just look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.